So let's see. We're still in airspace, section 04D. Is this part 5 or something like that? I think it's part 5. I'm not sure. In any case, the last time we met, we did a chart. We did a chart. Does anybody remember that chart? One for three people remember that chart. It was a pretty fun chart. So if you wouldn't mind whipping out your chart. And so, Freddie Rick, at the top of this chart, how high is this chart? Is this right there? Yeah, right here at this corn, at this peak, how high is that in altitude? 18 feet. No, try again. 18,000. Is that uh, MSL or AGL? MSL, okay. And Brandon, the level of this line down here at the bottom, what is it? How high above? What's that? Yeah, I would call it surface, but I'll take ground. For some reason, it doesn't want to let me write. Mauricio, what level is this line right here in the middle? 10,000 feet. Is that MSL or is that AGL? MSL, very nice. Jordan. This dotted line here in this bottom corner, how high is this bottom, this dotted line? Yeah, look at your diagram. No, don't look at his diagram. His is wrong. No, I want Jordan to find his diagram. You were here yesterday, right? You do that big old honking diagram, right? Okay. So this little dotted line down here in the bottom right, how high is that? 1,200 feet. Is that AGL or MSL? AGL. Okay, did I miss? see? Uh, Rodrigo. Let's give you a tough one here. What are the air? What is the airspace represented by this top triangle? Echo and golf. Echo and golf. Well, that's way too easy. How about the airspace, Rodrigo, for this upside-down triangle? Bravo, asterisk, C, E, and what? Yeah, that's why, that's why, yeah, that's why in aviation we, we always say, we say uh, the phonetic alphabet, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta. So Bravo, Charlie, what else? Delta and Echo. Okay, we're on a roll here. So, Jaron, what's the airspace in this bottom right-hand corner? Which one? Class G or Golf. Okay, that was too easy. So how about in the bottom left-hand corner, Jaron? What, what's particular? Why, is, why are there two? Are these the same? One's during the day, one's during the night. Which one's at night? The one on the left. Okay, so... I'm going to draw this crescent moon. I'm just going to write night. And just for fun to make Jonathan, this class golf airspace, it has the same, at night, has the same weather clearance from clouds as what other airspaces? Bravo, Charlie, Delta, Echo. Mauricio. This little asterisk by the capital letter. No, wait. I already harassed you, haven't I, today? Okay, so it's Josh's turn. This little asterisk by the B, what does that mean, Josh? This asterisk right here by the, by the B, B is in Bravo? That's to remind us something about the weather minimums inside a class Bravo is not quite the same as it is in Bravo, Charlie, Delta, and Echo. So what is, it, what is that to remind us of? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw a little cloud while you're thinking about it. No, oh, Brandon doesn't know. Don't ask him. Okay, I'm going to come back to you. You're going to pull out your chart from yesterday? Freddie Rick, what's the general uh, uh, cloud clearance and visibility in class Bravo, Charlie, Delta, and Echo? That's the easiest one. The easy. Go ahead. Yep. Yep, 
That's correct. Okay, Josh, you ready? No? Do you have your diagram out from yesterday? And you don't have an asterisk. Oh, man. Okay, I forgive you. Does anybody want to help out uh, Josh on what that asterisk is? Go ahead, Jonathan. It, and how does that how does that apply? Stay clear of clouds in class echo airspace? Oh, it's for Bravo airspace. So in Bravo airspace, be clear of clouds. Yeah, what is it, Jonathan? You look out the window and you estimate is how you guess. You, yeah, you estimate. Ah, that's how far away I am because there's no good way to measure it. It's not like you have a radar that will bounce off or a laser that will bounce off of clouds and tell you. Okay, so, Josh, let's see what else you didn't write down. What's the visibility uh, required in class golf airspace during the day? One mile visibility, very nice. Okay, so what if you're it's still in gla class golf airspace, it's still during the day, and you're below 1,200 feet above ground level? What's the cloud, how far away from clouds do you have to be down here? Huh? Yeah, that's right. It's be clear. We don't even have to worry about visibility because it's the same. It's still one mile. I'm just going to write clear. Let's see. Uh, Brandon, how, what's the visibility required if you're above 10,000 feet and you're in echo or golf airspace? Five what? Five miles visibility. And Mauricio, do you know what the cloud clearances are? How far away from the clouds you have to be if you're VFR and you're above 10,000 feet? Okay, let's see. I'm trying to think if I missed anything. Oh, yeah, speed limits. So, Josh, what's the speed limit above 10,000 feet? Can't go supersonic. And what's the speed limit below 10,000 feet? 250 what? Say that again. Nautical miles per hour, and we can abbreviate that with a K. But is that indicated airspeed, calibrated airspeed, true airspeed, holy mackerel airspeed? What kind of airspeed are we talking about? Think of, what's that? Indicated airspeed. Yeah, that makes it really easy for the pilot because when you look at the airspeed indicator, what kind of airspeed do you always get? If you look at the airspeed indicator, you always get what kind of airspeed? Indicated airspeed. Yeah, so that makes it really easy. Did I lose it? Did I, have I missed anything else, Jonathan? Airliners typically cruise in the mid 30,000s, maybe a little lower. It depends on the airliner and how heavy it is. Maybe the low, t the high 20s, but usually they crack 30,000. It de also depends on how far you're going to go. Um, the shorter the distance, the less economical it is to spend your gas, it's to spend your fuel climbing. Generally speaking, it's about a thousand feet for every. Uh, 10 miles. So if you're going to go 100 miles, you go to at least 10,000 feet. If you're going to go to 200 miles, you go to at least 20,000. But then part of it is just where does air traffic control want to stuff you? And do you really want to fly around at 250 knots indicated below 10,000 feet? No. Do you really want to fly around with VFR traffic below 18,000 feet? Because ATC is not going to separate you. It doesn't have to separate you from the VFR traffic. I'm usually going to go past 18,000 feet just to go get into class alpha airspace, and now I have air traffic control. And what is air traffic control, Jonathan, doing for traffic separation in class A airspace? All aircraft, because all aircraft are in class A airspace are. What kind of rules are they following? 
They're all following IFR rules. Okay. All right, so here we go. Special use airspace. One, two, three, four, five, six. We're going to talk about six different types of special use airspaces. We're going to go to the holy mackerel one first, prohibited areas. So prohibited areas are on sectional charts, and they're blue. And you can see they got that line with the funny little lines on it. You have a question, Mr. Flores? Uh, when I was in the military, I was never authorized to go into a prohibited area. I did, however, fly in alert areas, warning areas, and restricted areas. But I think if it's a prohibited area, about the only time you can fly inside of a prohibited area is if you're like an F-16 trying to shoot down somebody who's in the prohibited area. That's a guess. It never came up. But there are some restricted use airspaces around Area 51 in Nevada, and there was a couple of three times, at least twice, because one time we did red flag and we flew those, through those restricted areas with other aircraft trying to shoot us down. And then uh, another time where we practiced uh, changing low-level routes in flight, and I, I, we flew in a restricted area that was right next to the restricted area of Area 51. I was the pilot who, when he violated federal aviation regulation by flying over President Jimmy Carter when he visited the small town of Naval Incha. Actually, he was at a orange grove, and I was a solo student. And it's past seven years, so I don't think the FAA is going to come after me. But I violated an FAR, which says you can't fly over the president, ever. But at that time, I'll confess that it was my fault. But... Uh, but uh, I, did, I hadn't read that regulation, and nobody had mentioned it to me. And nobody came looking for me. So I got away scot-free. 1977, what's the statute of limitations for most crimes? Seven years, except murder. You never get out of that. But I didn't murder anybody. So let's see. Let's see if we can find a prohibited area on this chart. Find one uh, near Fresno. Let's try flipping it upside down and seeing if there's one. Well, I don't care. If half of you look on one side and half of you look on the other side. Can you find it? And next to it, it'll say P-125 or P-492. Did you find one already? It's a small one? Okay, cool. Can I borrow this? So there's Fresno and there's Mono Lake up here. And there's a prohibited. Oh, no, that's a restricted area, R-4811. It looks like a prohibited area. They, they, they can be any shape. Just there's, They can be any shape. But it's going to be blue. There's not any good restricted areas around. I correct prohibited areas. Hardly any restricted areas either. Maybe there's no areas on here. There's one in northern Arizona outside of Flagstaff. It's, a, it's an, an army, armor, uh, uh, arm, arm de arm, army depot where they keep weapons like bombs and bullets and stuff like that, and there's, so there's a real small prohibited area over it. And I'm trying to think. Right, there's also a prohibited, there's a prohibited area over the White House. There's a prohibited area over Camp David, which is where the president goes, hangs out, although this president doesn't seem to go to Camp David. He tends to go to uh, Trump Towers in Manhattan or to, uh, where is Mar-a-Lago? Mar Mar-a-Lago, that's in Florida somewhere. But those are taken care of by temporary flight restrictions, TFRs, which we're going to talk about before today is over. Nobody can find a prohibited area. Lots of restricted areas, yeah, especially for the, uh, Nevada. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, the restrict. So just for fun, if you go back to where Fresno is, you go back to where Fresno is, and you look north and to the west, that is up and to the left, you'll see a restricted area, R2531. It's sort of a five-sided, it's, it's, it's not a perfect pentagon with even sides. But you ought to be able to find R2531. And so you'll also find up by Mono Lake, can I borrow this again? Up by Mono Lake, you'll see a restricted area up over here. So on a chart, the only difference you can tell between a restricted area and a prohibited area is one has P dash something, and the other says R dash something. So whenever you see these these areas that are restricted, 
you're going to pay really close attention to them because prohibited areas, you never get to fly through them. Air traffic control is never going to let you fly. If you're on an IFR flight plan and you file a flight plan that goes through it, they will change it. You won't get to fly through a prohibited area. All right. Let's look up that, restrict, that restricted area. Let's look at that one that's north and west of Fresno, that uh, R2531. Can I borrow this for a second? 2531. If you look on the other side of the chart, you'll notice there's a whole bunch of data up here. You can find R2531 in there. In fact, since it's blue, I bet you you'll find it in the blue letters. R20, was it 2531? Yeah, so look up in here. On the right, correct. 2531, okay. I'll see if you can find R2531. See if you can find R2531 in there. So does anybody want to read that line out loud? What R2531, what does it say on the chart? I know it's hard to read. Up, up to, but does not include 4,000. Okay, that means I can fly over. Now, do you think that's MSL or AGL? It's a really good question whether it's MSL or AGL. But it doesn't say. I'd have to look that up. So that means you can overfly it. That thing's probably only, you know, three or four or five hundred feet above sea level. So I could probably fly at 5,000 feet MSL and overfly it. Every restricted area is different. That other restricted area over by Mono Lake is, excuse me, thank you. Where was it? Oh, yeah. It's uh, 4811. Look up R4811. What does 4811 say? Go ahead, Josh. Close to 15,000. I'll bet you $100 that that's MSL. So every restricted area is going to have a different altitude. There might be a restricted area that goes to 60,000 feet. I've seen restricted areas that say unlimited. Although at some point it's a satellite in orbit, and that doesn't count. Because that's space, space, not air, space. So if you see it, now you know where to go to look to find the data on whether or not you, how big it is, how tall it is. is does it say, like, who to talk to or anything there? What else does it say on that line? Can I borrow this? Does it say Oakland Center? You'll notice it says controlling agency is Oakland Center. And you're like going, Oakland Center? Who in the world is Oakland Center? Because that's not Oakland Approach or Oakland Tower. So let's see if I can find a better place to draw. Yeah, I could draw on this one. Woo! Look at that. So let's say here's the ground. And let's say that here is Class C airspace over Fresno Air Terminal. And let's say I'm and let's say here's here's ten thousand feet. And let's no, let's, I don't like that. Let's try again. So here's the Class C over Fresno Air Terminal. And right, it's only Monday through Friday, so that means on the weekend it's not even there. So you could fly right smack through it because it's not there. When I say you can fly right smack through it, it means you can fly right smack through it without talking to anybody. What I'm going to go into here in a second is the fact that you can fly through a restricted area as long as you talk to the controlling agency and they tell you it's okay. So if I really think I need to fly through that restricted area, I can call up Oakland Center. But you guys don't know who Oakland Center is. So if I'm talking to Fresno Air Terminal and I call them up, let's say I'm 20, so here's the center, and 20 nautical miles away, I'm going to give them a ring. 
probably what this is, is right around like this. Remember, if, we, if you look back at the chart, there was two frequencies for the Class C airspace, one with north and one with south. So we'll say that north is in this direction. We'll say south is in this direction. So here was like 119.25, and here was 132.75, or whatever it was. And this was Fresno approach. Or, if you were leaving the airport, it'd be Fresno departure. And you would say the word Fresno. But what if you're not in this airspace? And you know, let's say you're flying along, there's, there's, there's a reason why a VFR pilot might be talking to somebody, and that's you can get a thing called VFR flight following. And what VFR flight following is, you call up the, the center, and you say request VFR flight following, and if they're not too busy, they'll say roger, and they'll probably give you a squawk for your transponder, and they'll want to know where you're going. And then, if they have time, they will give you VFR traffic advisories, and they will tell you where all the blips are on their scope that they think are going to get close to you. It's Tomahawk 3435 Juliet, traffic at 1 o'clock, 4,000 feet, heading north. And then what you're going to do is you're going to look, and if you can't see it, whoever it is, if it's Oakland Center, Oakland Center, 435 Juliet, See it. That's what they're doing for IFR traffic automatically, although technically they aren't required to separate IFR traffic from anybody except other IFR traffic. If they have time and they see other airplanes around the IFR airplanes, they'll call that IFR airplane up and tell them where the traffic is. It might be you. It's just that they don't have to do it. It's the same if you're a VFR pilot and you request VFR traffic advisories. They don't have to do it if they're too busy. They can say unable. But if they're not too busy, they can do that. So you might be flying around. Let's say you're flying around here at 13,000 feet. You're probably in Oakland Center. Because Oakland Center is a huge area. We're, we're talking Oakland, California. That's different than Southern California. So Oakland Center may cover 200 miles north of Oakland and 200 miles to the east of Oakland. And it might go all the way down to Bakersfield. And if you're not in Class C airspace or you're not talking to Fresno approach and departure, you're probably talking to Oakland Center. And they don't, they don't publish where these are on VFR charts. They publish them on some IFR charts of where the center is. And that's where you can find the frequency really easy. Uh, it just If I ask for a VFR flight following, I usually get handed off to Oakland Center. Uh, it just depends on what mood I'm in. If I think there's going to be a lot of traffic, I do. The place where I think VFR flight following, if I'm flying like from here to Arizona, there's a bunch of restricted use airspace right over, right slightly south and to the east of us. So I'll fly down past Bakersfield and go over the Tehachapi's and then turn and go east. And I'm just south of Edwards Air Force Base, which is right smack in the middle of the restricted area. And there's a lot of VFR traffic right in there. So I'll usually call up somebody and get VFR traffic advisories. Just so it's not just me looking out the window. There's also now an air traffic controller looking at screens. To, to, and, and, they, and if that airplane doesn't have a transponder, they might just say, and, and isn't transmitting its altitude, they might say, Tomahawk 3435 Juliet, traffic at your 1 o'clock unknown altitude. So I, all I know is I look out the window and I go to 1 o'clock, or correction, I go to 1 o'clock. I'm looking out the window, there's noon, there's 1 o'clock. I'm going to look out in that direction, but I don't know what altitude to look at. But that's better than me just looking out the window between eating my, you know, peanut butter and jelly sandwich. We need a better sandwich. We've done peanut butter. We need a better sandwich. Are there any sandwiches we haven't talked about yet? Italian herb and cheese. So that doesn't
chips, herb, and cheese? Huh? Oh, Italian meat and herb and cheese. So there's a lot of pig in there, right? And fat, mommy, and stuff like that. Okay. All right, Italian meat and herb and cheese. So Oakland Center is our air traffic controllers. So you're not talking to the U.S. military or whoever is running that restricted area. You're talking to the air traffic controllers because guess what? They know who's in there and who's not. And they know whether or not they can let you fly through it or not. If they say yes, you can fly through it. If they say no, you can't. Okay, so what happens in, uh, uh, I guess I could go back because I didn't tell you. What happens in prohibited areas? Prohibited areas, there's usually something going on on the ground, and they don't want to have to worry about anybody flying over it and doing anything stupid. That's why, that's why they put one on top of the White House, and that's why they, I don't know what's there in those two places in California, but there's something there they don't want little dinky airplanes flying over it. Uh, those areas are not big enough for test bombs. Like I said, the prohibited area that I know of in northern Arizona is a weapons depot. They store a lot of, because I've flown next to it and I looked at it. So you can see there's bunkers and stuff. They go, ooh, I'm not flying over there because then somebody will take off and come chase me. I do, oh, you follow them. Well, it's really hard if, I'm, if you're flying 100 knots and F-16 comes to get you, they can't fly 100 knots. So they'll put their flaps down and they'll fly as slow as they can, and there's a whole set of procedures on what to do, but effectively, they're going to want you to follow them. And so if you have retractable landing gear, you're going to put your landing gear down and you're going to wag your wings saying, okay, I'll follow you. But it's going to be hard. And what you really need to do then is crank your radio over to 121.5 because 121.5 is the emergency frequency because they're probably going to be transmitting on 121.5 and saying, yo, 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 stupid ass over that prohibited. I mean, uh, aircraft that just over the prohibited area XYZ in northern Arizona. Uh, you need, oh, they'll tell you what airport they want you to land at, and they will be federal agents there waiting for you. And they will ask you a lot of questions. If you flew over the White House, you'd be in jail. You'd probably end up in jail. If you flew over one of those prohibited areas, it depends on if anything was seriously happening at that moment. Uh, as to whether or not they take you into custody. But if it was a prohibited area, you're probably going into custody. If it's a restricted area, probably you're going to, your, your pilot certificate will probably get suspended. If you don't follow them, yeah, prohibited areas, they, they could shoot you down in a prohibited area. They might not wait. Well, it's prohibited. It's prohibited for a reason. You think it's a good idea if people are allowed to fly over the White House of the United States? Probably not a good idea. So I'm going to highly recommend you not test my the, as to whether or not they'll shoot you down. I'm not going to highly recommend that. So prohibited areas are places where something's going on. They don't want anybody to overfly it ever, 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 ever. Restricted areas, things go on there, and it's not quite so bad because air traffic, if they're not doing whatever it is they do, Air traffic control might let you fly through it. Yeah, Brandon. A lot of people are buying drones and stuff like that. You're asking a great question. What happens if somebody flies a drone in a in a prohibited area or a restricted area? They're going to they can do the same thing to you that they would do to an, a pilot who was flying an aircraft through it. Because you have you because now in the United States drones or is they're small unmanned aircraft systems or S U S
huge RCs, yeah, and the places. Yeah, the places that you would need to go, the places where people do a lot of RC, remote control flying, uh, as long as the person doing the flying, it's their hobby, they're doing recreational purposes, and they're not getting paid, then you don't need an FAA certificate to fly those remote control aircraft. They're aircraft. They're small unmanned aircraft systems, but you only need that little plastic piece that says remote pilot if you're going to get paid while you're flying it. Does that make sense? Question, John? Compensated. Yeah, like you give me a free pizza and I'll take pictures of your house with my UAV. Pow, I need a remote pilot certificate. Or I say, no, I don't have a remote pilot certificate. I'll do it for free. No, you can't buy me pizza. That getting, receiving, compensation is really the word. You were compensated for it if you got a, t a gratuity, a tip. So no, you couldn't accept that. Leg legally, legally you couldn't do that. Would it be difficult for the FAA to find out about it? Yeah. Would you still be violating federal law? Yeah. Is it really worth a pizza? I guess it depends. All right. It depends. Okay. So let's go fast over restricted area. Restricted area, something is happening in that airspace that's hazardous to people flying through it who are not participating in that exercise. Like many years ago, back in the previous millennia, you all remember the, 19th, the 20th century, right? Okay. I was in the service. And one of those years that I was on uh, B-52s, we went to Red Flag. And Red Flag is an Air Force exercise. They play war. It's like playing G.I. Joes, except with multi-million dollar airplanes and bombs and guns and missiles and stuff. So that's one nice thing about being in the military. It's like playing G.I. Joe. Except for G.I. Joe, if you screw something up, all that happens is the leg falls off your G.I. Joe. In the military, when you're playing war, if bad things happen, people die. In any case... We flew re through restricted areas outside of Nellis Air Force Base, Nevada. So there's a lot of restricted use airspace there, and there's a lot of airplanes there. So letting little tiny puddle jumpers like a Cessna 172 or Piper Tomahawk fly through that airspace, it, it, we'd have, you'd have to stop doing it because you'd be concerned about mid-air collisions. So the reason some of that restricted airspace exists is so the military can go in there and practice and only have to think about the military aircraft and not worry about little tiny airplanes to run into. Which is why, and the air controllers know who's in there, so they know when the area is hot. Saying that the restricted area is hot means that somebody's in there doing it, and if the restricted area is hot, they're not going to let you in. Pretty much all it's because somebody's flying around in there doing something. Is that that again? Could they be building aircraft there? Oh, yeah, but usually if they're building something with aircraft instead of a airspace which stays on charge for years, they'll do what's called a TFR, a temporary flight restriction. And we're going to talk about TFRs uh, before this lecture is over. I don't know if we'll get to it today. We're having too much fun talking about small UASs and dying while we're playing G.I. Joes in the U.S. military. Whoops. All right, warning areas are per very similar to restricted areas, except generally speaking, they're out over the water. The international airspace kicks in 12 miles out off of, the, off of the coastline. So the problem with warning areas, that's not technically U.S. airspace. It's technically international airspace. So technically, the U.S. government doesn't have control over it. So guess what? Warning areas, you can fly through them, and you don't have to talk to anybody. I think you're pretty stupid to fly through a warning area. I have been in a warning area in a B-52, and the gunner shot the 50 caliber Gatling gun. So we literally flew out over the water so we could shoot bullets and not have to worry about where they went. Of course, we contaminated the ocean with lead. Question, Brandon? It was a tra training, because gunners hardly ever get to shoot their guns. How would you like to be a trained gunner and then not get to shoot your gun? 
Don't you hate that? Of all the time, I train, I was on nuclear alert for two years, and for two years, other than a simulator or other the computer playing a game in the airplane while we were flying, I dropped a pretend nuclear weapon, one pound fake bomb. It was the exact shape, size, weight, it had the right parachute on it, it acted just like a nuclear bomb did, except it was just full of concrete and steel, and across five years, I got to do that once. It was fun as snot. Yeah, it was fun. Are you kidding? I'll, t- I'll tell you that story one of these days about uh, about that one. It, as it turns out, it was my very last flight in the service. I just didn't know at the time it was my last flight. Did you have a question over here? So warning areas, when you think of it, let me know. So warning areas are like restricted areas, but they're off the coast. They aren't owned. The airspace isn't owned by the U.S. So you don't have to talk to anybody to fly in them, but you're stupid if you don't. So you always, there's always going to be, so we could look up warning areas on our chart. It would say who the controlling agency was. And if we wanted to fly through it, that's fine. But it's recommended that you call up the controlling agency. So there's not an airplane above you shooting 50 caliber bullets. Jonathan. Generally speaking, where is international waters? Generally speaking, most countries claim out to 12 miles. And they say, that's our airspace, and you can't go in it unless you ask us. And if you don't ask us, then we're going we're gonna to launch our F-16s or F-15s and go mess with you. But there are some countries that say, oh, we own it out farther than 12 miles. But most countries say it's at 12 miles and farther. Am I answering your question? Now, that doesn't mean if there's an airplane that's 100 miles away, can the U.S. military launch airplanes, go out there and fly next to it and say, yo, what's up? And they don't say those exact words. But, yeah, of course they do. Question, so, Brendan? So is that why uh, the U.S. Air Force is up Close to the United States? Yes, I think you have a valid point. So, um... Interestingly enough, uh, one could argue if you're going to launch a missile over another country, it really needs to go into space. The question you're asking effectively, how high does your altitude go above a country and you get to say that's my airspace and you can't put anything in it unless you talk to my air traffic controllers? I don't know the answer to that question. That's a really good question. How high does that have to go? But uh, let's see. so just for fun. Oh. The T U ninety five, here we go. That's not a T U ninety five. Well, a lot of them are done by T-95s. I don't know why they put Mr. Putin in there. But in any case, so here's a Russian bomber, and this is a Raphael, so this is a European fighter. Uh, but this Tu-95 bear, it's the Russian equivalent of a B-52. And there were a few B-52s a long, long time ago that the United States used for reconnaissance flying. But the Soviet Union, they liked this airframe, so they made some of these Tu-95s to be reconnaissance. And I can tell you this, the following is all unclassified information. So what other countries will do, in particular big countries like the Russia, like the United States, they will fly close to other countries, and inside of the aircraft will be a lot of radio receivers, ones that can receive radar frequencies, and they'll wonder, how close can I get before that radar energy is hitting me? And then you mark it down on a map, and now you can say, okay, when I'm within 300 miles at this particular spot, their radar can pick up our airplane. So now this is called in electronic intelligence, and sometimes it's abbreviated ELINT, electronic intelligence. What the United States does, we don't use B-52s, we use RC-135s. It's a tanker, it's a big four-engine job that we've had for a long time. We put a bunch of people inside it and a bunch of radios, and we fly close to the Soviet Union. You think in the Soviet Union, 
that there's pictures of KC RC 135s with Russian fighters that flew up next to it? Oh, yeah, there are. In fact, that's what we were doing. I don't remember how many years ago. It's probably been a decade. We were close to China, and we were using a P3 Orion. It's an E3, E standing for electronic intelligence. A bunch of people listening to radios and radar frequencies and stuff, and we were flying close to China, and the China Chinese sent an airplane up to go, hey, man, what's up? What are you doing up here? I mean, they don't use that accent. In any case, the pilot was 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 uh, got too close of the Chinese fighter plane, and it hit our airplane. So anybody, that, and just remember, a P-3 Orion is a big four-engine job. It's like an airliner. could hold about 75 people. It's not that maneuverable compared to a fighter jet, which is very maneuverable. So it, the Chinese were saying, oh, oh, man, your airplane maneuvered to hit our airplane. So I don't believe that. In any case, uh, that air, I don't remember if that pilot died. They had to eject. But our aircraft got damaged enough, it had to land in China. And so... Uh, Many pieces of information and equipment were destroyed in the airplane before it landed. So, go ahead. In my understanding, and this is all from unclassified sources, that at flight crew, when they realized it had to land in China, started destroying some of the equipment and the documents on board the aircraft because it was secret stuff. And they knew they were going to land in a foreign country and get, get captured. And it took, a, it took a month or something before we could get the people back. I don't know if we even got the airplane back or not. So they did what they were. They, you know, there's some, there are smart people all over the U.S. military, and they're figuring out all these scenarios. Well, what if this happens? What do we do? They had a checklist to follow. Here's the piece of equipment that we need to take a hammer to. And here's the documents that we need to throw out the window over the ocean or whatever, however they destroyed them. I don't have the details. If I was to tell you what you would do on a B-52 in case of nuclear war and you're going to have to land somewhere, what would you need to destroy? I couldn't tell you that because that would be classified information and I would be violating federal law even though I'm not in the U.S. military because keeping military secrets doesn't have an expiration date. Although I suppose I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. Although technically that's against the law. So you're going to see pictures like this of U.S. and, and other Allied airplanes next to a TU-95. TU see, there's a nice picture of a TU-95. But I know what I need, a good picture of a TU-95 interception. Here we go. There's, this is a picture. It's an old one because we don't fly F-4s anymore, but we went up there and we checked it out. And then here's another picture. Oh, look, here's a modern one. Here's a TU-95, and there's an F-22. So, you th so I'm telling you that the Soviet Union flies TU-95s next to the United States and other countries, and those countries, and it's in international airspace. It's in international airspace, so it's legal to do it. And the other jets go up there and go, hmm, hmm, hmm. I don't know, maybe they do more than hum. And then, uh, but if you think the United States isn't doing the exact opposite, I, I don't believe that. So if we typed in RC-135 interception, I can't type here. So look, here's an RC-135. Oh, this isn't, that's not, is that an RC-135? And look at that. Here's a Russian fighter came up to say, yo, 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 what's up? It's just this, that kind of picture doesn't get published in the United States very often. No, you're in international airspace. You don't have to do what anybody says if you're in international airspace. We're there just, uh, how can I say it? Let's say the United States flies an RC. Like here you can see there's extra bumps on the airplane. There are antennas in here. Look, there's something sticking out of the back here. I don't even know what it is. So it's trying to receive radio signals of some kind. So let's say you fly up within a, you know 125 miles from the 
from Russia, and they send up an Su-27 fighter jet. Why do they send that up there? So you'll know that they know that you're there. So you won't go any closer. And I don't know what all the protocols are because I've not talked to people that have flown RC-135s or EP-3s. I'm sure we have protocols that say, well, if somebody's fighter jet comes up and flies up next to you, here's what you're going to do. But everybody knows. These, these may not be legal rules, but everybody knows what those rules are. So they don't, they, don't, uh, they don't turn their radar on and lock it on and make you freak out that they're going to shoot a missile. And you don't try to shoot them down, and you try to, don't go any closer. But I don't really, I'm just guessing now, I'm just guessing about what that is. But you could join the U.S. military and be on an RC-135 and sit in the back and listen to radio frequencies and look at radar scopes and stuff. Uh, very likely. Um, if I was running the Russian Air Force, I would want my fighter jets to be able to fly into countries and land at air traffic control towers that weren't Russian. So I would want my pilots to be able to speak English because that's what all air traffic controllers can speak. It, international, international language of aviation is English. You can go to any airport on the planet and the air traffic controller has to be able to speak English. So it's easy if you live in the United States because a lot of the air traffic controllers in the United States spoke English from when they first started speaking. Question, Jonathan? U.S. civilians can travel to Russia? Of course they can. 